So um, let's begin. Uh, welcome uh, to this final event of our uh, webinar series, Artificial Intelligence and Religion, uh, co-organized by our center, the Center for Religious Studies and the Center for Information and Communication Technology of Fondazione Bruno Kessler in uh, Trent, Italy. Um, let me just briefly recall that this event is being recorded, so if you do not wish to be recorded, please keep your cameras switched off and your microphones um, muted. Now, unlike in the previous events, today we will not have a main speaker, but rather a series of short statements and a discussion on promising lines of future research in artificial intelligence and religion. Hi, Massimo. Good to see you. <laughs> Uh, so, um, warm, a warm welcome, first of all, to, to uh, today's discussants. Um, Margherita Galassini, as she mentioned earlier, until recently a colleague here at the Center for Religious Studies in Trento and now in uh, Warsaw. Um, Inken Pohl, Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Heidelberg in Germany. Uh, Oliver Krüger, Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Fribourg in Switzerland. Massimo Leone, Professor of Philosophy of Communication, Cultural Semiotics and Visual Semiotics at the University of Turin in Italy. And last but not least, uh, Robert Geraci, Professor of Religious Studies at Manhattan College, uh, New York. Now, given that the time at our disposal is rather limited, I refrain from introducing our discussants in any detail and would like to invite you to consult the webinar website air2020.fbk.eu for the short bios, including references to recent publications of um, today's discussants. Let me put this link again into the, into the chat. Here we are. Okay, um, so a very brief overview of today's program. Um, first, we will have a round of short statements uh, following an alphabetical order. Um, then we will have about 40 minutes for discussion. And the idea is to reserve the first part of the discussion to our speakers and to open the discussion to questions from the audience at a later stage. So um, in case you have uh, questions later on, just let me know in the chat. Um, that you have a question and I will keep the list. So without further ado, um, let me give the floor to our first discussant on future lines of research in AI and religion, uh, Margarita Galassini. Margarita, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Boris, for your, um, for your introduction. Um, and uh, please just interrupt me if, if I go uh, over the five, five minutes allowed. Um, now, directions for future research in AI and religion. Um, one aspect that I, I would like to, to discuss today, um, it's one aspect that I, I believe is worth investigating and, and that actually Boris um, and I are, are researching together um, as we are working together on, um, on, on a paper that will be published in a Routledge volume entitled Religion and Politics in Europe. Um, uh, this particular aspect of the interaction between religion and AI has to do with the role of religious or belief actors in EU policy um, making processes on issues concerning AI technologies and in particular the, the ethics of AI. Now, why does this aspect deserve the attention of researchers? Well, firstly, EU institutions are committed to an open dialogue with religious and non-confessional organizations and um, the European Parliament actively engages with them on EU policies. Now, this has not always been the case. Um, indeed, when EU institutions were first established, there was no specific mechanism for dealing with religious issues, um, nor for engaging with religious organizations. Um, this is because the secularization of European societies at the time was particularly strong and um, the influence exercised by religion on, on international politics was expected to decrease significantly over, over the years, over the decades. Uh, but actually things, things changed, things went differently. Um, and um, Jacques Delors, president of the European Commission, launched a dialogue with religious representatives. Um, this dialogue was then institutionalized with the Treaty of Lisbon, 
which introduced Article 17 of the Treaty on the Functioning of, of the EU. Um, and this article provides for the very first time um, a legal basis for an open, transparent and regular dialogue between EU institutions on the one hand and churches, religious associations and philosophical and non-confessional organizations on the other hand. Um, so the EU Parliament hosts uh, several high level conferences every year, um, open to all dialogue partners on, on issues related to um, ongoing parliamentary work. So um, besides um, this, uh, this background, let's say the, the EU has started to take um, faith based organizations into account also when framing its external policies. Um, this is because the EU acknowledges the, the, the important role that these organizations um, have to play in several fields, including climate change, development, um, humanitarian aid, and, um, and conflict resolution, for instance. So, given the increasing engagement of, of EU institutions with regular, with religious or belief actors in a number of different policy areas, um, there is reason to believe that a similar level of engagement and, um, and deliberation may also occur with regard to the policy area of, of AI. Um, and indeed, this has already occurred. Um, there's already evidence of, of engagement um, in this field um, between a, EU institutions on the one hand and religious or belief actors on the other. So um, just, to, just to give you two um, examples, religious or belief actors have been actively involved in debates and consultations launched by um, EU institutions on the ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. So in, um, in 2018, the EU Commission established a um, high-level expert group on, um, on AI. Um, in 2019, this high-level expert group published a set of ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI. Um, and prior to this publication, religious or belief actors have been involved in the process in, in at least two ways. Um, they participated to the public consultation launched by the Commission on, on, the, on the draft of, of these ethic guidelines. Um, and then in March 2019, in accordance with Article 17 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU, um, the EU Parliament held a dialogue seminar with um, religious or belief actors um, on precisely this, this aspect, on the ethical concerns raised by AI. Um, and then finally, a more, a more recent um, contribution um, has to do with the European Commission's white paper on AI, which was published um, in February 2020. Um, after, after this publication, the Commission um, launched a public consultation on this document um, and um, and here religious or belief actors have contributed um, in, an, in, in, different, in different forms and in different ways. Um, in these contributions, which I, I analyzed in quite uh, much detail in, in, a, in a report that is published on the ISR's website, um, in case you are interested to learn more about it, um, in, these public, in these contributions, religious or belief actors um, acknowledge the, the, the serious significant risks and challenges posed by AI technologies, uh, both for societies and for the protection of fundamental rights in general. However, um, while acknowledging such risks, um, religious or belief actors do not urge the Commission to, to halt the development and use of this technology, but rather they, they support and propose ways to, to regulate it um, and to promote an ethical and sustainable use of, of AI-based um, systems. So just to, to briefly sum up, um, religious or belief actors have demonstrated their willingness to take part to EU-wide debates on the development and on the ethics of, of AI. EU institutions are committed to maintaining a dialogue and um, an engagement with religious or belief actors in many policy areas, including AI. And therefore, um, it is worth researching, um, one, what these actors actually have to say about these technologies and um, and the ways in which EU laws should regulate them. Um, secondly, 
how these actors are able to influence the policy making processes. So what are the institutional as well as the non institutional channels, let's say. Um, and finally, um, it's worth investigating the impact that religious or belief actors actually make. Um, so, for instance, to what extent will their contribution to the consultation on the white paper on AI be taken into consideration by the Commission um, when, um, when moving forward with its strategy and, uh, and proposed plan of actions? Um, so, so these are all aspects that um, we believe are, are worth um, investigating further. Uh, we'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Margarita. Um, let me give the floor to Robert, Robert Giraci. The, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I assume I'm going to be coming in just fine. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to offer a few thoughts here. Uh, and for the ongoing series here hosted by the FBK, I know that was a lot of work and I appreciate you guys putting it all together. Uh, I've got three kind of suggestions about domains for inquiry and one suggestion for how to put together projects in the future. Uh, and that suggestion applies more to people in some parts of the world than others. Fortunately, we have, you know, a solid base of research on a number of things like singularity equals religion or what have you. And so that helps us to move forward. And we know a moderate amount about how people will respond religiously to robots. Uh, but I'm not actually convinced there's a ton to be, you know, like if we engage how people will respond, people's responses change, right? Like classic example is in biotechnology, people talk about the wisdom of repugnance that supposedly there's like a yuck factor that something feels yucky, so we shouldn't pursue it or what have you. But the reality of it is in biotechnologies, people change their minds about what's yucky and what's not yucky, right? That, that in vitro fertilization might have felt repugnant in 1972, but at this point, it's an extremely common technology. So I think we'll be changing and adapting as things come our way. And, and you know, obviously that counts for religious people too. So, so kind of the three things, the three domains. Uh, first is AI around the world. Um, and that breaks down in my head into some kind of immediate issues. One, AI is a, like a development opportunity. How do we leverage AI to mitigate social and income inequalities? How can religious groups incorporate AI as a technique in solving shared problems? Um, religions can be productive inspiration, right? How do we draw on global cultures to go beyond profit motives and short-term gains? Uh, how do we produce better conversations with people in industry? How do we participate in policy discussions? Like um, the research that Margarita was just talking about, which is terrific sounding. I look forward to reading those. Um, but so that, like in thinking about what's going on around the world, the, you know, cultures are different and the way in which people will engage machines is different and the uses to which they will put the machines is different. Um, and so I think a big part of the conversation has to be figuring out a, a good global conversation. Uh, the second domain that strikes me as kind of um, new and interesting that robots do for us something that previously we might not have done is to actually reveal certain aspects of how religion operates. Uh, how do things like the bless you to robot or the robot that, that performs arty, that's the, the waving of the camper flame in front of a Hindu murti, right? Like there was a, there was a robot that performed the puja, the arty part of puja for, um, for a Ganesha in like 2017, it was all over the, the news and so forth. Um, but what's sort of interesting is when you insert something kind of novel, like a robot or other AI fueled technology, into that domain, it possibly tells us something about what we think is actually going on in that religion that might be different than what people had previously thought, right? What is, if, if the robot is performing RT, is that just as good as a human being or not? And if not, why? And so it, it, it provokes certain questions about the operations of religion itself. And, and the third domain, which I think will be growing, especially over the next couple of days, uh, decades is, is human computer and human robot interaction. Uh, years ago, when I was doing field work at Carnegie Mellon, uh, Dave Turetsky, who's an AI guy there, and I, I quoted him saying this in my first book, he said, you know, if you're going to have robots that do things like elder care, then you need to have robots that can be responsive 
to the kinds of things that a lot of people talk about, including people who are older, right? And he said, if you couldn't, if you had a robot that could not engage someone's, someone in kind of a conversation about religion, then it wasn't going to be particularly helpful, um, if for anything other than you know menial tasks. Uh, and so I think as robots get more sophisticated, as the AI engines get more sophisticated, the human robot interaction uh, will be a will be a really interesting domain for people to be doing research and trying to understand the world we live in. And there are already people, you know, there's uh, Gabriel Travado, who's in, um, I think he's at Waseda University in Japan right now, has built a, a small robot to assist in things like uh, the catechism or prayer. Uh, those kinds of things, those kinds of technologies will continue to uh, develop. And so that could be a non-trivial component of future religious practice, right? So, so trying to understand the role of religion in human robot interaction and more broadly human inter a human computer interaction seems like uh, it will net some pretty interesting um, opportunities. So with these three like kind of domains, right? The robots is what they reveal about religion, the human robot interaction part, and the, the question of kind of a global sense of AI. Um, I think methodologically, we need to push more and more heavily toward collaborative research rather than individual research. And there, there are reasons for that. There are language differences, the need to uh, acquire empirical data. Uh, there are different disciplinary skills. I mean, if you're working with someone who's in robotics, right, who's building a thing, then you have very different perspectives on what might be at stake. Um, and there's a reason why sciences and some social sciences do a lot of collaborative kind of work. Uh, and in my broad field of religion, science, and technology, most people don't. Most people do individual work. And, I, and so I think the future really is one of collaborations. And of course, that raises the, the kind of final question of how you get busy people to do things. It's always tough. Uh, and how to build collaborations. How do you find people who are going to share those interests and so forth? And I'm, I'm not sure I really have a great solution to that. You know, there is now, for those of you who aren't aware, there's a religion and AI seminar associated with the American Academy of Religion, and they have a webpage, but I admit I haven't been to it in a couple of months. So I don't know how robustly it's being used. Um, but, but we need some kind of platforms that, or I don't know, a Discord channel, that's where the kids are these days, right? Some way in which we can find out uh, more about one another and look for ways to collaborate with one another. Um, and, you know, I think that's a powerful contribution to the kind of things that FBK was doing over this past year, because it does give people an opportunity to see different uh, research arcs and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's where I see us maybe hopefully going in the future. Thank you very much, Robert. Um... Now, let me give the floor to Oliver Krüger. The floor is yours, Oliver. Yeah, thank you, thank you again for your kind invitation. And I completely agree with the call for interdisciplinary work and exchange uh, that Robert has placed here. So the question in, in my research in the context of this um, platform here would be, what could the analysis of transhumanism and posthumanism provide for our insights, also for uh, formulating a response to, as you wrote in your invitation, a response to the white paper on artificial intelligence um, published by the EU, European Union's Commission. So if we look on post and transhumanism, we see here it's an absolutely positive outlook on the future and the benefits of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, especially the singularity, solves all problems of humankind. And this is partly embedded in religious cosmology and salvation history. In my view, the analysis of these extreme positive progressive agendas, outlooks on the future may help us to reveal in other contexts technocentric language, agendas, and euphemistic narratives of artificial intelligence. It could sharpen our senses. So 
if we, for example, go through this white paper of the European Commission, it becomes clear uh, directly that the main argument here is we have to support the development of artificial intelligence because we are, I quote, in a fierce global competition. And they, of course, they address a lot of risks and challenges. But in my view, the greatest risk, the greatest existential risk is excluded. On page one, they write, they do not address artificial intelligence for military purposes. And this plays a major role. And in my view, we have a lot of discussions, for example, in philosophy, when it deals with artificial intelligence, um, discussing the, the decisions made by autopilots of uh, self-driving cars. But that's, in my view, a kind of kindergarten game, a philosophical one, in comparison to the challenges we face in the arms race that is accelerated anew. Other questions like surveillance, um, data access, and the political sector are addressed, but mainly the narrative here, again, is very positive in this statement by the European Union Commission. Data access is mainly an opportunity to make business. And the greatest risks that they address on every page is the challenge for the trustworthiness of artificial intelligence. And accidentally, this is the main agenda of the Oxford Institute for the Future of Humanity. Um, when it started in 2007, 2008, um, initiated by Nick Bostrom and Anders Sandberg, uh, the agenda was very transhumanist. That means they want to spread a, or, or, or make a better understanding possible of artificial intelligence and to provide yeah, greater trustworthiness in this future technologies. So I think the, the risks uh, that the European Union addresses here in its white paper are a little bit too euphemistic to positive. And I hope we can use the analysis that we in cultural studies are doing on these progress philosophies like post-humanism, like transhumanism, also to reveal languages or the use of language, the use of certain narratives in political discourses. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Oliver. Um, next is uh, Massimo Leone. Massimo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to participate in this very uh, stimulating event. So on June the 10th, 2014, uh, Ian J. Goodfellow published the seminal article Generative Adversarial Nets. The article proposes a new framework for estimating generative models uh, via an adversarial process in which two models are simultaneously trained. A generative model that captures the data distribution and a discriminative model that estimates the probability that the sample came from the training data rather than from the generative model. The generative adversarial model has led to revolutionary applications in artificial intelligence and deep learning, including the creation of artificial faces and deep fakes. A semiotically oriented philosophy of digital communication aims at reading technologies of meaning in the long period of the history of human signification systems in order to detect implicit ideologies in the creation of new devices, processes, and artifacts of meaning. Uh, 
Artificial intelligence is not an exception. Its development is characteristically underlain by specific preconceptions about what intelligence is, how it should work, and what kinds of results it should beget into the world. When read through the lenses of the semiotics of artificial intelligence, then, two aspects in Yen J. Goodfellow 2014 are particularly striking. First, the conception of artificial intelligence that it expresses is based on the idea of antagonism, neither cooperation nor mere competition. Second, the metaphor that best explains the new deep learning architecture is that of the struggle between the forger and the connoisseur, in particular in the forgery of fake money. As regards the first element, the elaboration of generative adversarial networks adheres to a specific conception of intelligence. Artificial intelligence is often imagined and represented in ways that stress its neutrality. Social criticism has already pointed out ethnic or gender biases in the training of artificial intelligence, for instance, in its inability to detect non-Caucasian faces in digital pictures. Yet, although this kind of criticism is certainly important, it has now become part of common sense and it is even often exaggerated. Whereas a much more abstract bias of artificial intelligence is usually overlooked, that is, the fact that it is conceived having in mind a certain semiotic ideology of intelligence relating to what being intelligent ultimately means. The semantic field of intelligence is indeed patterned by ideological tensions concerning the features, role, and expected results of human intelligence and its projections onto non-human realms. A long period perspective could detect these ideological tensions at work in the conception of divine intelligence, the intelligence of non-human animals, as well as more recently in the intelligence of non-living entities, such as entire cities or machines. From the late 1990s on, for instance, the semantic field of intelligence has increasingly overlapped and blurred with that of smartness. Intelligent and smart are not the same. Smartness can be defined as a sort of practical intelligence, as an intelligence that is mostly applied to problem-solving processes, leading to the better adaptation of a subject or a community to the environment. The wisdom of most ancient Greek philosophy, conversely, referred to a sort of abstract intelligence that was not usually characterized as smartness. This kind of smart intelligence, indeed, is defined not only in relation to its results, but also to its temporality. No smart form of intelligence is usually characterized as slow. From the 1990s on, indeed, and especially with the emergence of the notion of smart cities, collective intelligence has been imagined as effective and fast and as linked to with the computational power of machines. As it is often the case, the imagination of the smart intelligence of machines and cities has retroacted on the intelligence of human beings. Intelligent humans have increasingly been characterized as smart humans, endowed with a fast, adaptive, and effective intelligence. Although alternative imagina imaginations were possible in the semantic field of intelligence, for instance, the attitude to reflect, to ponder, to meditate, to consider alternatives, to delay action in favor of deeper consideration, etc., they were all discarded in favor of a model of intelligence in which the temporal aspect of fastness was as predominant as the pragmatic one of effectiveness. This ideal of excellence as fastness has been more and more criticized and replaced with alternatives in many domains of social and cultural life. First, the domain of gastronomy, reacted to fastness through the creation and development of the slow food movement that inspired many other fields including the academic one with the idea of a slow professor the domain of computation however as well as that of artificial intelligence never endorsed any idea of slowness and on the contrary 
adhere to a straightforward notion of intelligence as fast effectiveness and smartness. So this is my first statement. We should encourage the field of artificial intelligence to develop, at least theoretically, the possibility of uh, bringing about artificial contemplation. Artificial contemplation is what is missing, I think, in the domain of um, um, research on artificial intelligence. Thank you very much, Massimo. Um, we now come to the final short statement um, in this first part of our event. And uh, Inken, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I also would like to suggest three fields of further research. Firstly, I remember that I was very impressed by Jakob Shodaris. You remember, I think it was last September when he spoke, uh, remarks on AI as providing powerful technologies of immersion. New technology based on augmented or virtual realities provide innovative immersion practices. They promise access to otherworldly spheres that have been produced digitally. And I suggest that we study how imagined religious transcendencies have to compete with these new digital transcendencies. There are more and more examples of apps based on AI that pervade into areas such as mindfulness or counseling. So AI is competing with classical religious and spiritual services and development that we have to observe closely in order to be aware of its consequences and its possible risks. So my first future research point is the competition of religions and AI. Secondly, I suggest that we study how the rapid spread of AI eventually changes agents' perceptions of religions and religious teachings and practices in a hidden, at the same time, fundamental way. People increasingly turn to Google with their questions about gods, about death, about spiritual life, about life after death. And as we know, algorithms navigate the answers. Simultaneously, the questions create new algorithms that control the search engine. In doing so, Google generates new religious ideas and notions that we have to observe in order to keep track of the origins of these religious ideas. Because, as we know, religions as imagined realities have the tendency to gain control over people and I think it is necessary to be aware of the fact that we might be controlled by powerful stories that are actually generated by algorithms. So my second point of future research here is to focus on religions generated by AI. And thirdly, during this lecture series, we heard about the many problems of AI. And among these, Oliver just mentioned it, is for example, the use of AI in the field of, um, of the military, uh, deep fakes, uh, the new net states uh, we heard about. Um, other problems is, the, of course, the close connection of interest and power and capital in technological development and the potential of AI to exacerbate inequality. And of course, um, the huge problem of the elaborate androcentrism of uh, the whole field of AI. So from the perspective of religious studies, what strikes me as particularly dangerous is the capacity of AI to perpetuate and further broaden the gap between the social worlds and worldviews of men and women. Or to put it more accurately, AI has the potential to broaden the gap between the representatives of hegemonial masculinity on the one hand and the rest of the world. Here, um, the diagnostic potential of religious studies can co could come in. Um, the approaches of material religion can especially make an essential contribution towards the answers to questions such as how do discourses on AI manifest? Which designs are used to present AI as progressive and inevitable? What makes AI applications so attractive? How do computers, smartphones, gadgets, and the Internet of Things draw people towards them? 
how do AI enabled devices attack the sen our sensors and attach themselves inseparably to their users? So my third point here is uh, in German the Suchtpotential. So the capacity to uh, generate addictions to AI, which I think we have to research with the help of the methods and theories of religious studies and material religion. From where I stand, the applications of the theory of religion can make a very important contribution to evaluate our growing dependence on and addiction to AI technologies. Thank you very much, Inken. Um, so this concludes the first part of our, um, of our meeting today. Uh, we now have uh, five short statements concerning um, promising lines of future research on AI and religion. Um, it is not a, a simple task to, to, to sum this up again, but I will try nonetheless. Um, the idea is now to have really an open conversation first between um, between uh, the discussions on the topics which have been talked about, which have been touched upon, and then to open up to um, further questions from the audience. So um, let me give it a try. So the, the first, uh, um, first statement of uh, Margarita's statement concerned the, um, um, the role or the idea that, that we should research the uh, the role of religious uh, or belief actors in um, in uh, policy making concerning the regulation and um, the regulation and, and normative uh, framing of AI in society. Um, Robert then. Uh, suggested uh, three things. Uh, let me just um, uh, recall the, the point on AI around the world. Um, in this, in this uh, context, he also stressed the need for um, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary collaboration, uh, given the, uh, 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 the fact that um, uh, many different scientific kinds of expertise will be needed to really understand um, differences in the, in the uh, development, adoption, interpretation of artificial intelligence uh, technologies in different um, cultures. Um, then we had the, the, the topic of uh, uh, human-computer interaction. Oliver then uh, mentioned uh, or, or um, made a rather interesting statement concerning, if I got it correctly, um, the need to analyze um, the way in which um, uh, risks connected to artificial intelligence technologies, their uh, development, adoption by societies, and so on, are described. So critiquing the way... Um, so on the one hand, if I got you correctly, Oliver, you say, okay, it is, of course, um, a good thing that the European Union uh, mentions and, and tries to, 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 explicit, uh, to make explicit these uh, risks, but the, the main, the real existential risk is not uh, really put on the table. Um, uh, on the contrary, it is explicitly uh, excluded from the white paper, but as military uses of artificial intelligence. So, um, and the, the role, of course, um, uh, of, or, or the way in which um, the analysis of extremely positive outlooks on technologies, including AI technologies such as transhumanism, um, could help us understand what's going on also on, a, on, the, on the level of rhetorics, uh, I think, in the description of risks and um, even the, the, the idea of creating trust, cre creating, I mean, trust can be created in many different ways. It can, of course, it's what they want is trustworthiness. So what is trustworthy? That, that, that's the question, really. I mean, you can create trust in a rather uh, misleading way, for instance, so, um, but that, that, was, um, that was Oliver's point. Massimo then um, um, draw attention to certain connections that are uh, implicit, let's say, implicit conceptions of uh, intelligence linked to such things as smartness and speed, um, which are operative um, in 
um, AI researcher in the way um, uh, narratives about AI are being set up. So there, in that context, he talked about the semiotics of AI um, and called um, and, and pointed out the need for what he called um, uh, artificial contemplation. So in response to, in a certain way to other um, uh, um, similar calls for slowness um, to, um, to see whether and to what extent, um, if I got you correctly, Massimo, um, maybe this paradigm or implicit paradigm of um, intelligence equals smartness equals more or less uh, um, fast efficiency, um, whether this can be critiqued and maybe maybe uh, replaced by other ideas. Um, then finally we had uh, Inken's three points. Uh, on the one hand, the competition of religion um, on uh, religion and artificial intelligence in offering um, experiences of transcendence of different kinds. Um, uh, then the uh, the way in which um, uh, the adoption of artificial intelligence, the ever broader adoption of artificial technologies, changes the perceptions of uh, religious practices, materialities, um, and um, uh, and I'll, yeah, maybe I would also, even if I know that you don't like the the word, I would also include beliefs. Um, uh, I think, uh, and um, yeah, and then we had. Uh, Finally, please, uh, uh, I apologize if I, if I missed something here. Um, um, the, the reference to, to, um, to Jakob Chaudhry's uh, talk at the beginning uh, of our webinar series, which um, um, highlighted the ways in which, um, in which digital technologies create uh, new kinds of, of, of spaces of imagined or digitally created um, transcendence. So I hope I have, uh, I'm sure I haven't, um, haven't really uh, done justice to everything that has been said, but this was more or less the frame. So I would like to open the discussion. Just feel free to open your mic and, uh, and uh, comment or ask questions to speakers and so on. Inken. Uh, thank you very much. I actually have two questions, uh, one for Margarita and one for Robert. Um, given that, uh, that uh, given the decrease of the importance of religions in at least Northwest Europe and more of that, given the very many scandals, the devastating unethical behavior of religious actors, I think of my own field in Buddhism, I'm wondering um, if it's not necessary to look, to ask for what reasons are these religious people uh, asked to participate in these ethical discussions at all? Because I'd say this serves very many functions, but it's not really serving, helping us with finding good ways in dealing with uh, of AI and the reasons for that is what Oliver said. Um, uh, well, well, and I think it goes. Well, it fits to what Oliver said because uh, there, there are um, there are many other reasons why they are why they are asked. That's one thing. And the other thing, Robert, I really liked it how you said that we have to that we have to cooperate. But my big problem here is whenever I ask people, engineers or informatics, they say. Or for your hundred thousand euros project, I'm not. I'm not even. I'm not doing anything because I'm getting so much money from the industry. So I'm wondering how this is working in the U.S. and if the communication is better. At least in Germany, it's really, really difficult to get uh, these scientists on the same at, to the same table as uh, the people from humanities and social science. Yeah. So, uh, Margarita, would you like to? respond sure sure uh, thank you Inken, for your very interesting question uh, i thought about this question myself many times 
So I'm going to first give you, let's say, the answer that I believe EU institutions might give you, okay? So their uh, rationale for engaging with religious or belief actors is twofold, let's say. So one, um, you know, it's grounded on their commitment um, to defending religious um, or belief freedom, okay? Uh, so for, for this reason, they, they want to actively engage religious or belief actors so that they can make sure that, you know, this, this very important fundamental freedom is actually uh, taken into account when, uh, when deliberating on, uh, on, on policy issues. Secondly, um, these institutions increasingly consider religious or belief actors, organizations, as uh, part of the civil society, okay? So just as they engage with other actors from the civil society, they, they are also more willing, willing to engage with religious or belief actors, okay? Also because, as, as I mentioned before, um, religious or belief actors' role in many important policy areas is, is, is increasing and, and therefore they can be considered as, as, um, as partners, okay, on, on several policy, in several policy fields. Um, then I'm going to add another uh, reason, which, however, is, is my, let's say, one of my, my considerations, okay? Um, so when we, especially when we think in terms of, of ethics, of AI, okay, um, we have, you know, philosophical convictions, philosophical beliefs, which can motivate uh, considerations as regards what ethical and unethical uses of AI could be. But we also have religious views, which um, may be considered on a par with other philosophical convictions and beliefs, right? And this is also the, the account, um, the, the position taken endorsed by EU institutions, which consider on an equal level, an equal par, religious and philosophical or non-confessional organization. So just as you would, you know, ask um, a philosopher, you know, uh, we have a self-driving car, uh, shall it kill one person or five people, you know, give me, motivate me your answer, okay? Uh, in the same way, we might want to, we might want to listen to, to the opinion of, of, of a religious um, person, of a religious group, you know, giving me um, answers which are ultimately grounded on their convictions, whether that's, um, you know, a, a religious or atheist, let's say, um, perspective. Um, so thank you. I'm going to stop here. Thank you, Robert. Concerning the uh, situation of uh, transdisciplinary work in the US. Yeah, so since the goal here was future projects, um, I, I have to confess, <laughs> I think the, the current state of the art is rather limited in terms of how people are building collaborations. Um, I do think that one possibility, you know, if if you have a project that requires someone, you know, in a technical field and all the local technical people are going, hey, that's the, the peanuts that you're talking about are not worth my time. Um, it may be that you might be able to find someone in a technical field in another nation for whom that level of funding would actually be significant. Now, from my perspective, like I'm not I haven't, I've, I've got too many projects that I haven't managed to wrap up yet to, uh, to, to there's a, a guy in Japan that I'm kind of interested in collaborating with, um, but I am interested in writing grant proposals for that kind of work, uh, but I haven't done it yet. So I haven't had to really enlist someone yet and be like, okay, we're gonna do this thing together and here's the money that's on the table. But I do think, you know, I mean, my work with, you know, I do a lot of my work in India and, um, you know, the, the funding, there are significant funding differentials between, you know, Europe and America and India. And it might, and there are lots of bright people in India who might be willing to join in on that and whose English will be strong. So for someone like me with limited language capability, you know, I'm from Texas, I barely speak English. Uh, like the, that maybe that kind of collaboration could work or other forms of international collaboration. So hopefully that wouldn't be the only possible outcome because you'd want comparative stuff, right? If you're working with say someone from, you know, sub-Saharan Africa and someone from India or Japan, I mean, you'd want a comparison that said, well, this is what people in the US are thinking too. So I don't know how you, you know, draft those people when the money's low. I guess you gotta like just, be really compelling. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know yet, but but hopefully hopefully that's a problem I'll have as I start looking at 
future projects and future grant applications. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, are there any other questions, comments at this point? So even, yes, Can I just course, say something course, real quick? Sure. I'm just really want to say how delighted I am that I was afraid we were all going to like say the same thing and it wasn't going to be all that productive to have five people say the same thing over and over again. And I'm really just delighted uh, what our colleagues here, you know, people seeing, and this is partly why it's so important to bring people together, right? Mm -hmm. Like, because we're not all thinking about the exact same problems and the opportunity to see those different perspectives is pretty valuable. So I'm just grateful, you know, for, for the event and for, for the uniqueness of everybody's contributions. Thank you, Robert. Yes, that's, uh, that's also my impression. Uh, Oliver, you've opened your microphone. Would you like some to say something or? Yes, may maybe. So thank you, of and course. I and I completely agree. Um, these these different perspectives could could really benefit from each other, uh, and even more in a face to face conversation, which we didn't have in this format, unfortunately. But maybe building upon uh, a little bit on the impasse on the input of Massimo Leone. The question of the ideology or maybe even the semiotics. What is lacking in, in my view here is, I think, the idea that the Enlightenment philosophers of the 18th century uh, brought into the discussion, into the discourse in their time. They experienced the beginning of progress, of societal pro progress and technological progress. And they began to, to consider what is needed for progress to be yeah, sustainable, to be trustworthy maybe, um, and to provide something for the whole of society. And of course, this was science, that was technology, but they added a third aspect and that was moral. So, People like Joseph Priestley, Edmund Law, William Worthington were considered as the moral philosophers. And the moral they introduced in the discussion of, of their new progress philosophy was considering the aims of progress. For them, the solution was very easy. It was a kind of idea of the perfectibility of the human being, partly in the frame of religious Christian thinking, partly in the frame of a secular approach. So what I would like to ask also as a response to the white papers, for what aim are we doing research and application of artificial intelligence here? What the European Commission offers is for making better business and better security. But as we all know, business does not automatically become better if we have better means to do business. If the system has still the aim of exploiting the planet. Security sounds nice, but on, on the other side of the, count, of the coin, that means also that security um, the increasement of security in society could mean also an increasement of surveillance. So I miss a little bit this discussion for the aims of artificial intelligence. And thank you. I would encourage to go back to the 18th century to our colleagues in Enlightenment period. Thank you very much, Oliver. Uh, Massimo has raised his hand. There you are. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And thank you also to uh, Professor Oliver Kuger for uh, uh, this uh, very insightful um, second statement. Um, indeed, uh, uh, I think that it is necessary to go back to that period also in terms of deeply understanding what is the philosophy behind the creation of artificial intelligence. 
um, it is very difficult to understand uh, the procedures of artificial intelligence without a grasp of um, probability theory and nonlinear algebra uh, as they are taught uh, nowadays to the actually very young creators of new artificial intelligence algorithms. Uh, uh, the um, good fellow that created uh, generative adversarial networks uh, was a PhD student when uh, he created this uh, revolutionary algorithm. Uh, but now he's one of the most influential uh, people in the world. Uh, he's mm, still in his, I think, late 30s, but he directs the program of artificial intelligence at Apple. Um, so what does it mean when someone who has studied um, probability theory as Stanford and nonlinear algebra as Stanford then comes up with an idea of um, um, artificial intelligence, which is actually a sort of a mimetic idea. Uh, it's the idea of two um, uh, artificial actors trying to outsmart each other. What, what, what kind of <laughs> um, uh, philosophy um, of humanity actually um, lies behind this idea of intelligence as outsmarting um, because the consequences are huge. Uh, the consequences, for example, are the fact that uh, when you have two machines uh, trying to outsmart each other, they become more and more intelligent uh, as the outsmarting challenge goes. But the gap between their intelligence and the human intelligence increases. So the result is that uh, um, if there is a, an artificial intelligence that acts as a forger, an artificial intelligence that acts as a policeman or as a detective, they will become smarter and smarter, but human beings will become less and less able to control um, either of them and actually to distinguish between the forger and the detective. So uh, I really encourage um, uh, th this kind of uh, analysis of the uh, very uh, deep-seated models of humanity that are behind the creation of the algorithms, because we focus too much about the applications of artificial intelligence, but we should look at the algorithms and how they are actually created in mathematical terms. Thank you very much, Massimo. Um, I don't see another uh, hand raised at the moment, so maybe I can permit myself, even though I shouldn't do this as a, as a chair, but, but to, to, to add one uh, one point, um, uh, which also which regards what uh, Oliver and said regarding the um, consideration of um, ends, um, and uh, what uh, Massimo said before about the. Um, connection between, at least the, the ideological connection uh, between intelligence, smartness um, and uh, speed, let's say. Um, I mean, another way to look at this or another entry point into this discussion would be uh, to look at certain definitions of artificial intelligence, which very often go like this. So the goal of artificial intelligence um, as, a, as a research field is to develop agents which act and now intelligently, where intelligently is um, uh, then explained as rationally. So there's an equation between intelligence and rationality here. And rationality then is further uh, narrowed down to instrumental rationality. And the model of instrument, the idea of instrumental rationality is of course, um, um, completely neutral to the aims. That is, you have an aim, an, a given aim, and then the agent acts rationally to the extent that it maximizes the probability to reach this aim through a given action, where the aim itself is set. So um, there, there is another connection here, and I think it also, it's also a connection with, um, um, of course, earlier. Uh, German philosophers, in particular with um, the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, um, that is uh, the uh, the idea 
And then, of course, in Weber and Max Weber, then this is very important. The idea that, um, in some sense, we should try and bring into a discussion at the philosophical, not not, not necessarily abstract philosophical level, but into the discussion a um, um, a um, an evaluation of the ends of the to which uh, artificial intelligence systems are adopted as means. So, and unless that kind of discussion takes place, the, the whole thing hangs in a sense in the air, normatively speaking, from the point of view of, 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 of moral philosophers, at least. So that was my, my what I would like to, to add to the discussion. Inken. Um, the discussion uh, about the ends is very interesting, but from the point of view of religious studies, we have to ask who is defining the ends mm -hmm. and who is deciding uh, about artificial intelligence and the development of artificial intelligence and who has the power in artificial intelligence and who is benefiting. So I think particularly when I hear, hear the word outsmarting, I think it's a gender problem from the very beginning until the end. Um, who is, uh, who, I mean, what gender has the idea to create a robot? Not women. Women are able to get children. So uh, I think we have to look into this whole discussion and um, I would like to uh, suggest that, um, I don't know, um, actually I would like to suggest to myself uh, better rhetorics to better bring in, to, 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 to open up the hearts of my male colleagues, mostly male colleagues, for all these ideas. Yes, please help me out here. Thank you, Inken. Massimo, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, I, I think uh, Inken's suggestion is absolutely excellent and uh, it is a crucial element of how artificial intelligence is at the moment imagined, conceived and, uh, and implemented. This, this idea of outsmarting is, uh, of course, not gender neutral uh, at all. You know, it comes from a very long history of, uh, um, and so it's it's a uh, absolutely crucial uh, suggestion to me. Thank you. So maybe this is the moment where we can um, open up the discussion also to questions um, from outside, outside the uh, restricted circle of our discussions. So if you have um, a question, please just uh, let me know in the chat or raise your hand. And yes, Marco Ventura, Professor Ventura, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, religious studies have been uh, mentioned here and there. Uh, more or less directly, my question would be straightforward. Uh, how disruptive this new agenda of research on AI is going to be? In uh, well, and I, 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 I think of many different perspectives, in, including whether to to decide to engage with AI as a as a theme, as a topic, as a horizon, or not, and then. Uh, and then, you know, moving to m many other aspects. W would that be, in the end, business as usual with some adjustment? Or is AI going to be uh, di really actually disruptive? And, and the issue of gender m m m is even more provocative in a sense, uh, because it, it, it might add disruption to disruption in a sense especially as uh, we experience at the same time uh, a gender uh, sort of women women based gender uh, movement in, in religious studies uh, at the same time as we also experience in religious studies and beyond an, an actual sort of beyond gender as a whole and, and of course with AI this going be beyond gender gender beyond gender is going to be even stronger so um, well, I don't know if anybody is willing to take uh, this this question from my side, but basically uh, bringing narrowing it down to a slogan: How disruptive is AI going to be for 
um, religious studies. Oliver, would you like to yeah. answer? We also have Robert then. Yes, so, so, so a, a quick answer only. I think it's an opportunity. But it would mean also to readjust our perspectives a little bit. For more than a century, we, we were doing research on a secularization paradigm. So that is built on a strict separation of science on this side and religion on that side. And yeah, lots of historical research, for example, by um, Walter Hanegraaff, Helmut Sander, Koch von Stuckrad, and many others have shown that already in the 19th century, with theosophy and anthroposophy, and then with New Age in the 20th century, with Christian science, and so on and so on. We have so many examples of exchange and and entanglement of both areas, science and religion. And so I think this is the adjustment we would need to, to develop new perspectives. And then research on artificial intelligence, computers, robotics, these kind of ideologies can be a, an opportunity for us. Robert, I see your hand raised. Um, thank you. Uh, first, just to build on what Oliver just said, I think even looking at religion and science questions kind of globally shows that those things were never demarcated. I mean, you can find examples in spaceflight, in, in bioengineering, in robotics, like, like all kinds of religious, pers what, we would, what we would call religion and what we call science are kind of always mixed up in a, in a institutional sense, uh, even if not for any one particular practitioner. Um, but in re respect also to the question from Marco, on the one hand, I'm leery of the word disruption, which is such a cheerleading word for Silicon Valley <laughs> to talk about how they're disrupting this and they're disrupting that. Um, but my hope would be that the more we think about AI, um, actually, the better that helps us think about all kinds of problems. You know, I'm thinking, for example, um, Randall Reed tried to train, and, and so far it's not, not as successful, I think, as he wants it to be, but they were trying to train a machine learning tool to look at the letters of Paul and be able to figure out which ones were the authentic letters of Paul. So I think that's a really cool kind of project, right? That, that you know, people know that, that Paul didn't write all the letters of Paul in the Bible. We've known that for a long time, and we can, you know, it's like a, a, a Venn diagram. These ones are Paul, these ones aren't Paul, and these ones might be Paul. Um, but it, you know, it may be that AI creates new opportunities for old problems, because we're not going to make any more progress on that old problem unless a whole host of new archaeological evidence comes into our hands. But maybe AI helps us change that problem. And we had um, uh, F. Laurent Schultz, you know, as part of the FBK thing just a couple of weeks ago, talking about questions of social dynamics and religious violence that he's trying to model and understand uh, using AI. And so I think some of the old problems maybe get some new uh, energy behind them. And at the same time, we get some new problems to start talking about, new things that, that might be of interest. And that might be, you know, I know that scholars in America, people who do the humanities are constantly wringing their hands about their relevance to wider society and how no one really cares what many of us have to say. They're like, oh, that's just academic, who cares? Um, but, but, the more we're entwined in these areas, the more probably relevant we become in policy areas and in in trying to look toward, you know, global human flourishing, that we might have actual things to say. And so it's not just that AI might disrupt what we're doing, but but at the same time, there's a reverse flow where maybe what we're doing becomes more powerfully relevant to the, you know, our wider communities. Thank you very much, Robert. So we have one more uh, uh, comment from Margar Margarita Galassini, and then unfortunately we will have to come to a close. Margarita, the floor yes. is yours. Thank you, Boris. Um, so go going back to Professor Ventura's question, how this disruptive 
can or will AI be for religious studies? I think it should be quite disruptive. Um, why am I saying that? Um, because for the first time in history, we're witnessing the, the emergence of a kind of authority, which is that of the algorithm. Uh, and we are ascribing the algorithm that authority, okay? It's not that like it was developed that way, but we're ascribing it that authority. Um, so we, we turn to that authority to get answers, to get indications, directions. Um, and we're going to do that um, always more, um, also with regards to to, to political issues and political decisions. So uh, the algorithm AI will, I believe, I'm afraid, increasingly become part of the policymaking process. Um, and uh, this sort of authority, um, which could direct societies also in political matters, used to be, uh, let's say, ascribed or restricted to religious authorities in the past, okay? And then, you know, secularism arose, um, and therefore politics and religion took to separate directions. Uh, but now with this new faith, with this new religion, uh, which, which is the algorithm, um, I'm going to say, um, I think we're, we're going to start witnessing uh, the, the bridging um, of the gap between this new religion and, um, and, and politics. Um, so there are many similarities between um, AI and algorithms and religion, I believe, uh, such as the fact that we can we can turn to it to, to ask directions, to have answers. Um, and we also just don't know how it works. Um, we, we just we just don't know much about it. There's no much transparency. Um, and there are also differences between algorithms and um, and, and religions, uh, such as the fact that algorithms are entirely AI is entirely artificial, entirely self-sustaining and self-developing. Let's say in a way that religions are not, um, and therefore I believe that there it, there should be much room and um, and also maybe like um, some sort of um, a lot of room for investigating, let's say this this direction that uh, this new religion is taking um, and therefore to let's say let's say compare uh, the role that uh, religions used to have in politics and the role that um, AI algorithms should um, and will play in in the future in politics thank you thank you very much uh, Margarita um, we've reached uh, the end of our discussion unfortunately because this should go on this should go on yes it should go on for much uh, longer i think because it's really really interesting and inspiring um to uh, um hear all these different um takes and uh, to see all these different perspectives um before um closing this event and the webinar series i would like to give the floor to the Director of the Center for Religious Studies of Fundación Bruno Kessler, uh, Marco Ventura. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's uh, just uh, for a, a final word of uh, uh, gratitude to all the speakers and the participants. This has been a fantastic journey. I personally learned a lot. Uh, the conversation was uh, always very, very genuine and deep, and um, it's been a real, real pleasure and a great lesson in all possible respects. Of course, I, I then uh, wish to uh, give my warmest thanks to Boris Reme, who's been leading this project uh, uh, with uh, uh, his, his strong will uh, and, and capacity and, and, and uh, with his, uh, you know, sensitive style, uh, he's been a great commander in chief in uh, no easy time. And um, uh, I owe him uh, a, a big, big, big uh, thank for, for this. Uh, this was, uh, uh, well, uh, a, a part of a bigger effort from, from his side within the within our center and within Fondazione, we never understood this series as uh, an isolated uh, item. It has always been a part of our uh, collective endeavor, of our mission, of our strategic plan. And uh, he's been uh, extremely sensitive to this, uh, even beyond what uh, maybe the public uh, might have perceived. Um, since this was uh, a collective endeavor, let me also thank uh, all those at the a, at a center who were a part of it, 
there with us uh, tonight as they've been uh, throughout all the episodes, uh, Deborah Tonelli and uh, Lucia Galvani and Paolo Costa and um, Marco Guglielmi, Valeria Fabretti, well, Margherita herself, our new researchers who are with us uh, tonight, Susanna Trotta and Deborah Iannotti, our PhDs, I see Matteo Corsalini is with us, and of course uh, our administrative staff, and much more than just that, uh, and in particular Isabella Mazè and the friends of the uh, centers of engineers and computer scientists at FBK. A big thanks from my, from, from my side, words are not enough to express my gratitude. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Ventura, for these uh, warm words. Um, yes, this, I guess, brings to a close the uh, webinar series, Artificial Intelligence and Religion, which uh, started in September last year, um, as um, uh, Professor Ventura mentioned, as one element of the Center for Religious Studies ongoing work, uh, the broader framework of, in of interrelations between religion and innovation. Now, looking back at 14 talks and discussions on various aspects of the interrelations and interactions between religion and artificial intelligence, I think it is fair to say that we covered a good deal of ground. Now, um, without recapitulating anything here, looking forward, uh, I hope that this webinar series has laid the ground for future exchanges and uh, collaborations um, on artificial intelligence and religion. Um, some um, some uh, uh, results are already uh, uh, coming up um, of collaborations which were uh, which began as part of this of this uh, webinar series. Um, okay, uh, finally, let me remind you that the videos of all past talks and discussions are available on the website of the webinar series at uh, air2020.fbk.eu. Um, you still have the link in the chat. So um, this just leaves me to uh, say uh, a big thank you uh, once again to our discussants today, to Margarita Galassini, Oliver Krüger, Robert Geraci, Inken Prohl and Massimo Leone. Um, and of course, thank you very much to all who participated in this final event of the Air 2020-21 webinar series um, or at some other point in uh, previous events. So uh, thank you very much again and goodbye. I hope to have the occasion to meet all of you again soon. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you very bye much. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.